ASEAN Breakfast Call. First and foremost news from Southeast Asia. Hi and good morning. This is Gauri and you're listening to DurianASEAN.com, the voice of discovery and sharing. And looks like it's going to be just me today. Uh, Grace and uh, Arlene are not here. Uh, Arlene will probably be joining us pretty soon. And, of course, we are having our first segment for today, which is the ASEAN Breakfast Call News Commentary. And uh, before that, I hope all of you are having a good morning. Of course, uh, today is a Tuesday morning, second day of the week. Hope everything is going well for you guys, those of you who are listening at home, or if you're on the way to work, hope you have a good day ahead. And just to start out, we have uh, news from India where they are where Burger King is actually looking to open a franchise in India and uh, we all know that Burger King is of course famous for their uh, beef burgers or cheeseburgers which uh, a lot of people prefer to McDonald's and in India of course there has been a huge outcry uh, in response to the opening of the Burger King because Although they are actually allowed to have an outlet there, they cannot actually uh, serve any beef. And the Burger King team has spent months developing a very unique uh, locally sourced menu. They, uh, they re- they've done their research. They've reached out to more than 5,000 people trying to get their feedback on what they like, what they don't like, what they want. And of course, none of them agreed to the slaughter of beef or even just uh, having the beef uh, patty in the burger Uh, Many people object to the slaughter of cattle, and of course, this is because of the religious reasons. And uh, however, the Miami, Florida-based company said that among some of the innovative items on its Delhi menu are whoppers made from mutton and chicken. So that's something new. So if you ever feel like having mutton or chicken in Burger King, you know where to go. The place would be India. And they also have a little uh, paneer melt sandwich which is made using uh, a fresh cheese popular in Southeast Asian cooking. And it's, of course, available here as well, but it's a lot more popular in uh, India in that sense. So uh, Burger King is going to India. And let's come back to Malaysia for a bit, where we have uh, our sports minister, Kari Jamaluddin, speaking in response to what happened with Lee Chong Wei. And he's asking for all Malaysians to come together uh, in support of our national hero, of course. He has been charged for using uh, a doping drug which was banned by the Sports Council and he could be facing an imminent two-year ban. But uh, the investigation is still ongoing as we reported yesterday. So... Uh, Let's come together and give him all the support we can and uh, hope for the best because he is a national icon and he has actually brought a lot of Malaysians together in terms of uh, uh, the sports spirit to uh, even start watching sports, especially badminton, which is really famous in our country. And moving on to Philippines. We have Filipinos trying to lead the war on Ebola. And uh, of course, according to the news, 138 Filipino peacekeepers under the United Nations mission in Liberia will arrive in the country on board a chartered flight from the West African nation. And while we're at that, let's say good morning to Arlene. Hey, good morning, Gary. <laughs> I was too busy at the Berlin Wall. Right. Just <laughs> admiring the view and... So you realizing. left me alone here. Yeah, I just realized <laughs> it, it, it's so beautiful to, to witness a country come together then they were apart, they were parted by ideologies. So yeah, I'm back now. Right, so we are just looking at Philippines now and how they are leading the war uh, on Ebola. And they are, and Ebola is like all the way in Africa, That's but they are leading the way. That's interesting. It is, and aside from the peacekeepers, they also have overseas Filipino workers coming from Ebola-stricken countries uh, who will be subjected to the same rigid safety measures. But yeah, Liberia is, is a different case. It's definitely uh, not 
safe to go there right now, and yet these people are actually taking a step ahead to go there and to help out the people. And it's, for a Southeast Asian country to do that is quite admirable. It is, it's such an irony because uh, there were reports uh, stating that WHO, World Health Organization, has failed on the global fight against Ebola. They were quite slow in terms of how to manage the situation. Instead, we see countries, individual countries, especially countries that we seldom hear, like Philipp- the Philippines, would come to... To be on the front, to be on the frontier, to for the rescue. And of course, the question would, that most people will be wondering is, if they are going there, does that mean that they're going to be infected? Does that mean they are going to bring back the virus with them? But of course, they uh, will actually be quarantined for 21 days before being allowed to come back here to their families. To to, to be fair, there, there's this one graph. Uh, what, actually, not graph. It is a is a a photo of the whole of Africa, and then the the only like that one tiny area which constitutes the west some uh, some of the countries in West Africa uh, that actually have Ebola, while the rest of Africa, which is probably ninety nine percent of uh, landmass of Africa, mm-hmm. do not have people infected by uh, Ebola. So it shows that. Just because all these different countries, uh, constitu- uh, you know, concentrated in West Africa, is uh, having a serious case on Ebola, doesn't mean that it, people are not taking precaution against it. And that was actually a pretty sarcastic map because I remember it said no Ebola, no Ebola, no Ebola. Even <laughs> and then when it came to Liberia, it said yes Ebola. So people don't have the perception that oh, okay, Africa like. Er- Every country that is affected, like I cannot go there. They are, so, they are entertainers mm. cancelling tours in countries that is not even part of the West Africa region just because it's in Africa. And that's due to people being paranoid, which is why when you want to fear something, it's always good to go down to the ground and do your research and find out where exactly it's affected and how dangerous it is before just making the assumption that, oh, okay, no Africa for anybody. (laughs) And uh, looking at this also, it seems that uh, in the recent Fortune magazine, Garcia narrates how he handled an epidemic that has so far resulted in 5,000 known deaths and more than 13,000 cases. That is a huge number. It's definitely a huge number. And that is where the criticism towards international organization like WHO mm-hmm. has mounted because how can you let people die, you know, vainlessly without resolving this issue early mm-hmm. on? And this is not the first time. Or, I mean, this year wasn't the first time that Ebola has inflicted uh, patients, but it has been quite on. Uh, it has been uh, ongoing for quite a few months. A few, in fact. Uh, they should have knew this would coming. And also, he actually said that he was flying the airplane and also reading the manual at the same time to try and find out uh, how to handle the case, how to bury the Ebola corpses. And the most important thing here, uh, according to him, is that he doesn't want unfounded rumors to continue spreading among people. He wants people to know what it's really about mm. and don't just have irrational fear. Mm. But, you know, for those who are patients or victims of Ebola, you, you do die a horrible death. You will have boils all over your body and it's not really something that people would want to look at. And let's move on to China where they are having their geopolitical tensions to take stage at the APEC. So all over the world, uh, a lot of countries are in China right now for the APEC meeting. Mm-hmm. But a lot of tension is between the superpowers. And the gathering is actually the biggest event yet hosted by the Chinese president who uh, took the office last year. And he spotlighted his country's expanding world profile on Sunday by declaring a bright future ahead for the uh, Pacific Rim. And also this... Uh, Sorry, what, what did you say? <laughs> Pacific Rim? Not the movie, right? No, not the movie. <laughs> that, that crossed my mind too, but... <laughs> And uh, this annual two-day summit of uh, APEC, uh, which is the Asian Pacific Economic Cooperation, 
is a rare chance for such a wide range of top leaders to all come together and discuss what's going on. But it's also a very good sign. It's something that we have been talking about for months. Like, when are all these leaders going to come together and sit down and talk about the problems that they are facing here? It's great that they are talking about. But what are the key issues that they discuss during the APEP meeting? What are the geopolitical tension that happen? Well, uh, we have, of course, the biggest power rivalry that's uh, in between uh, Washington, Beijing and Moscow. And Russia and China are both, uh, they both express their impatience uh, for the domination of U.S. in world affairs. And they uh, also, in terms of the U.N. Security Council coming in and uh, abstaining from the U.S.-led initiatives. And we also have Putin. <laughs> oh, I learned my lesson. <laughs> we have uh, Putin and the uh, Chinese uh, uh, Z who met uh, on Sunday in Beijing as well. For they are calling for the Cold War, as you mentioned yesterday, which is true. Uh, con- they, they are calling for the Cold War opening. So, no, no, no. They called it. Uh, they calling for the end of the Cold War, mm, which okay. is, the, the is the same the right term word. as as you used. And uh, no matter what changes on the global arena, they will still choose to stick to the chosen path to expand and strengthen their comprehensive, mutually fruitful cooperation. The future of uh, countries' relation or region re- relations between superpowers, between uh, countries that are minute, are uh, totally different compared to in the past. In the past, it's all about military might, it's all about the balance of power. But in today's uh, inter- very integrated world, you, you cannot have an enemy, especially an enemy that is so huge, like the US or mm. China or Russia. You you need to make friends. So Cold War is definitely a no-no. It's not the future of how mm. this today's society should function. Uh, and it will not be uh, something that would happen and in any possible way because economically, we are all integrated, unlike in the past. You can't even... Um, wear jeans in, for example, Russia during the Cold War, but nowadays everyone wore, everyone wear jeans and everyone listen to the same or almost the same music, so it's impossible. And another thing that was also being discussed was the uh, topic between Obama Z and North Korea, where following the surprise weekend release of two Americans who were imprisoned by uh, North Korea. And apart from that, of course, North Korea's uh, nuclear program. And also they uh, talked about the um, family photo where they typically wear the host national dress, but this is uh, not something that is important. But what's important here is that uh, they all came together, they all addressed all the pressing issues, uh, the maritime issue, the uh, issue with North Korea, the issue that's going on in Russia. And this is um, good because... We are trying to head for the uh, ASEAN 2015, and we want to have, we want to resolve all the problems that we are currently facing here. So it, the transition will be smooth. That's true. The transition hopefully will be smooth. And what is interesting, um, I mean, with the APEC talk that I observe personally is, um, they, they do come together on very critical security issue. Though uh, they didn't really talk about ISIS or other global threats. Um, like Ebola and other other means that they should be talking about. So this is another area. Probably APEC might be handicapped. Mm. I'll probably give them some time because they have just started addressing the ASEAN issues. So they'll, they'll probably get to there, but yeah. maybe in maybe a Maybe Putin moment. can talk about <laughs> it. <laughs> Putin. Okay. I'm sorry, Putin. I'm, I'm, I'm just <laughs> making fun. Stop. Yeah, I know. I know you're making fun of me. So um, we'll move on to... Uh, back to our country where there is a issue of uh, slavery here in the spotlight. Well, it's, This is not a new uh, case. It has been uh, ongoing for quite some time. The, the modern slavery that is happening in Cebu, uh, it is definitely uh, has costed a lot of uh, tension uh, to what is happening on the ground. But this is not a new issue. Uh, mm-hmm. As we all know, Malaysia is one of the worst countries to work in, especially when you are a foreign migrant. And especially if you are at the bottom of the <laughs> food pyramid or whatever you call it, the social mm-hmm. class pyramid, uh, 
if you are a foreign immigrant, if you are an illegal immigrant, if you are a refu- refugee, you will end up you know, working uh, either at no cost or very cheaply for all these companies and being treated like a slave. And in this context, we actually have a Sarawak oil palm waste factory who, which is being accused of enslaving its migrant workers and uh, shifted blame onto job placement agents in India for actually igniting an international controversy after a hired hand allegedly escaped and recounted horrific details of forced labour to a Mumbai-based daily. So we are famous in Mumbai now for the wrong reasons. <laughs> and of course, like you mentioned earlier, Modi must be it's very unhappy with Malaysia now. <laughs> and he, he, well, our Prime Minister should probably pay him a visit and talk him down or something. But yeah, like you were just saying, someone going back to their country and recounting horrific details, unfortunately, it's not something new. We've had uh, reports like this so many times, and yet there's still nothing concrete being done about it. Uh, So far, the only uh, solid measure was to increase the minimum wage for this uh, migrant or foreign workers. But apart from that... But it's not even being enforced. mm. There's also another uh, area that people, I mean, the government mm. needs to talk about. And yeah, apart from that, when it comes to their their rights as a worker, how many hours they work, how many days off they get, none of that is being monitored and it's so easy for someone to just exploit them and overwork them and most of the time, of course, their passport gets confiscated. So who are they going to turn to? Oh. Like, how can you move forward towards ASEAN integration? Mm. You don't solve this kind of issues related to immigration and migrant workers. It's an ongoing issue. It's been happening for so long. With more influx of foreign workers Mm. to either Malaysia's shores or to other countries' shores, this will only cause more havoc to this country. And of course, instead of solving the problem, now they're playing the blame game, saying this was all because of the agent in India who didn't give him the right information when he was coming over. Apparently, the agent promised him a lot of you know, <laughs> uh, benefic- benefits, sorry. And when he came here, he didn't get all of that. But of course, we we kind of know how uh, these workers are treated here in the first place. They even pay money to come to these countries. It's ridiculous. And it's a huge amount of money. Most of the time, they have to like sell their house or, you know, what, I'm not sure what you call that, where they have to loan their jewelry uh, and get some money so they can go back and claim it. And it's really sad when you think about the amount of uh, work or amount of effort they put to actually leave the country in pursuit of a better life for their families and loved ones. And then when they come here, they they don't get treated like a human at all. That's the sad, that's the sad part. I mean, yesterday we got angry with the Rohingya. <laughs> <laughs> how, how, you know, the government just are closing mm. one eye. I mean, it's closing one eye. But today we are just angry with the complete slavery, modern slavery that is happening in our backyard and we are not doing anything about it. And if there's anyone who can do something about it, it's uh, probably our Prime Minister. And... <laughs> and... <laughs> <laughs> dot, 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 I guess. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I guess we can do something about it too because there are a lot of NGOs actually uh, that are trying to get in these people who are being exploited and at least bring them to their embassy or send them back to their country at the very least. That's that's the best that we can do if their uh, condition here is really that bad and it's not being protected. And a little update on our uh, beloved country or my beloved country, Spain, <laughs> where the Cat- 80% of the Catalans have actually said yes to independence in what they Sorry, call... Sorry, your uh, beloved country? <laughs> It is my beloved country. <laughs> you got a problem with I, that? I have to call the Rela squad. I'm <laughs> no, just kidding about that. You can send me back to my country though, <laughs> which is Spain. <laughs> and yeah, so 80% of them have actually said yes. And this is, of course, the vote to form an independent state from Spain. And Joana Ortega, who is the vice president of Catalonia, said shortly after midnight that over 2 million Catalans have reportedly uh, turned out for the unofficial referendum. 
and she could not immediately give an official turnout rate since there was no formal electoral reform for some 5.4 million registered Catalan voters. So it's unofficial? It is un- unofficial. So how did they even done this if it's unofficial? So the voters were given these two questions. Do you want, to, do you want Catalonia to be a state? Or do you want Catalonia to be an independent state? So it was just a rough vote uh, of a yes and no from uh, all the Catalonians. So it's probably just to send out a message to their Prime Minister Mariano Rajoy (laughs) and yeah, hoping that he will get the message and uh, probably give them the independence that they want. So are you giving Catalonia independence since Spain is your home country? <laughs> well, unfortunately, I'm not Mariano Rajoy, so I cannot decide. But it reminds us, uh, reminds us of what mm. happened uh, with Scotland, the Scotland referendum, mm-hmm. which is a great thing. You know, you ask the local communities that do you want to be part of us or not. Um, the poll actually... Uh, I mean, in leading towards the official referendum, the poll actually changed uh, drastically from all no to all yes to all no again. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to the Catalonians, I can, uh, the the best way is to have a Catalonian, a Catalan referendum and just let them realize that whether they want to be part of a state in Spain or Mm -hmm. they want to have an independent And uh, what's interesting is there are a couple of comments here from uh, the uh, people who actually read the article and who are in Spain. And they said that no international or officials were actually present. Of course, we don't know how true this is, but uh, according to the comments, no international or officials were present. So it sounds like it was just rigged and it sounds like a total farce to me. I have no problem with independence, but corruption is all over Spain and this shows up. Uh, how best to psych up and brainwash the Catalan people. So this could, um, like you said, ha, if it's unofficial, how is it done? And uh, You have to make it official. You have to give time for both sides of the camp to campaign for their cause. Mm-hmm. And you let them decide and think. You cannot just say, do you want a state or you want an independent state? It's, it's not going to happen like that. It doesn't happen like that, in fact. And Catalonia actually accounts for one-fifth of uh, Spain's economic output and has no problem attracting foreign investment. Also, I know you're probably going to ask me about football. And actually, it is very relevant to talk about football now because the main team in the Spanish league, Barcelona, is actually made up mostly of Catalonians. So are you saying that (laughs) if, let's say, let's say uh, Catalonians (laughs) became independent, like how, you know, uh, Singapore get got away from Malaysia. Mm-hmm. All the they they will form their own league. <laughs> would it would uh, that be the case? It's not so much about forming their own league, but a lot. Okay, uh, I can I cannot comment on this without being biased because my team is Real Madrid and I hate Barcelona. But Barcelona is a very very strong team and it's always on top of the table. So if Catalonia gets independence, Barcelona will not even be in the league anymore. Why? And if it's Because Barcelona is in it's Catalonia? It's made up of Catalonians. So the oh, Catalonians really? will, will no longer be considered I Spanish people. I have no idea about people, this. So they cannot be in the Spanish league when they're not uh, you know, in the country anymore. They're in a different country now. So how can they play in the Spanish league? And that will, of course, be a major disappointment for ton of people all over the world because it's Barcelona. <laughs> I, I know that probably you don't know what that means, but Barcelona, when you think about the Spanish league, there are only two teams that you think about, which is Barcelona and Real Madrid. So if Barcelona is out, it's it will have a huge impact on the entire uh, Spanish league. And another football club that also has huge amount of Catalonians is actually uh, Espanyol. Ah, which Espanol. is uh, just a state club, but most of their players are Catalonians as well. So, so this sp- Spanish really pe- <laughs> <laughs> So the Spanish people think twice. Right. Don't let go of your lover. So can really mess up the football <laughs> if you think about it. You don't want to be lower than English Premier League when it comes to <laughs> the popularity of the sports. And uh, another person who voted for the unofficial referendum is also uh, Pep Guardiola, who is the former manager of Barcelona. And he's a very uh, revered man in uh, Spain itself. 
So a lot of people have actually casted their votes for this unofficial referendum. So we'll have to wait for the... This is actually a good indicator, but they should have an official one. Give time for campaigns from right. both sides. Right, we don't want to be excited about something that, that is not... Make it like the Scotland mm. referendum. I, I'm really impressed how matured the Scotland people are. Like The day after the, the voting... Everything is just normal, like, oh, it's business as usual. At least we made our decision. We want to stay in in UK. Mm. And uh, moving on from Catalonia back to ASEAN, we have the uh, some fresh diplomatic sparring over who owns the South China Sea is likely to be resolved this week, actually, at a major regional summit in Myanmar. So <laughs> finally, we will have... A solution, probably, for these uh, maritime issues that we've been facing for months. People were expecting World War Three in <laughs> Southeast Asia, <laughs> but, but you know, I, I think Malaysia, uh, the rest of Southeast Asia, as well as China, they realize they need each other. We we don't have, we don't have anything to lose for mm. being friends with China, but everything to lose to not being friends just because of a maritime area. So it definitely needs to be. Resolve. Mm. And uh, some of the leaders who will be present is, of course, U.S. President Barack Obama. He's just everywhere. And uh, Prime Chinese Premier uh, Li Qiang and Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi will all be at uh, Naypyidaw for the two-day ASEAN summit from tomorrow. So they are going to talk about it. And uh, I guess we will report, of course, the update or the outcome of the uh, meeting. Wow. Barack Obama will be together with the mm-hmm. two other one uh, biggest ASEAN, uh, not ASEAN, Asia country, India and China. That's impressive. It is impressive and uh, it's a very complex issue that that we are dealing with, especially with uh, China in the picture because it is a major superpower. So uh, we'll see what happens. I'll say go Modi. <laughs> go Modi. <laughs> go Modi. <laughs> so that's all the time that we have for this morning. I uh, hope you uh, learned a thing or two from our news commentary this morning. And of course, always keep up with us at fa- on Facebook and also Twitter. We always post the latest news from Southeast Asia and the world over. And don't forget to also subscribe to our YouTube channel and download the TuneIn app, look for Duran ASEAN and listen to us on your smartphones.